Ready, set, go. Let's talk about sport. So is there any dolphin fan in this room? Well, you'll be disappointed because we have no NFL player that's from the Dolphin tonight, today. Uh, but we have in, an incredible panel. So uh, we, uh, we have someone from the Charger, uh, Cowboy, and then the Seahawks. So you have a lot of diversity in this room. And then a childhood friend of mine who uh, two-time Olympic gold skier. So, and I know that Miami may be not the greatest place to talk about ski, but I learned that they have actually the largest ski club in the United States, which is very surprising. So um, I'm Stephanie Crosby. I'm also a board member of the International Economic Forum and the Miami Strategic Forum. And I'm, I've been in sport, in sport investment for a long time. And uh, one of the uh, sport that we invested, it's called Cell GP, Cell S A I L, and GP for Grand Prix. And it's a new league that was installed and created by Larry Allison and Sir Richard Coots. And it was about transforming sport into the global economy and bringing it to a new level. And it merged sport and entertainment with for purpose because it's one of the only sport that is completely ESG and it also merged technology. So I feel it's one of the most complete sport that is actually on the market. And all of these uh, panelists that you will meet have a really heavy background and they've all been champion in their own field of, of, uh, and as an athlete. But now they have merged into venture and sport, venture and businesses. So I can wait to hear this panel. And we're very lucky to also have Wayne Kimmel as the uh, moderator, who's an author, podcaster, and also our, uh, own a 76 Capital. So help me welcome this panel. Well, thanks, Stephanie. And thanks, everybody, for coming out this afternoon. I think we're going to have a lot of fun. The lights just got really bright on us. But uh, we, 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 we're going to have a great time and really excited to introduce you to this amazing panel of not only elite athletes, but now elite businessmen. And it's really one of the things we're going to talk about is just the overall sports industry and how it truly has become an asset class. And you're going to hear about all of them and all the things that they're now doing within the world of sports. So I think one of the best ways to do this, we have a lot of time. We're going to have a lot of time to go through a lot of all the things that they've, they've accomplished on the field, on the slopes. Um, and but first, why don't we just go down the, the the panel here, and I'll start with you, Isaiah, just to you know share your your background and what you're doing today. Yeah, uh, I'll share a little both, but, and I'll I'll probably take more time than I usually would, uh, knowing that we do have time. But um, yeah, I'm the founder of Will Ventures. We're early uh, seed stage focused venture capital fund. We're on our second fund. We just announced our. Our, uh, our second fund at 150 million dollars, and you know, really, really take a rigorous, disciplined approach to this perceived niche market of sports and how it opens up massive adjacent markets, primarily across consumer, health, and media. But there's there's also other different tangents from that. I know we're going to be kind of diving into a lot of different areas, but. Again, sports has always been kind of narrowly defined over the last 50 years, but you know, as the ultimate test bed, when you look at sports as the last captive audience, a live sporting event as the last captive audience, and one of the last things in our lives that we refuse to time shift, right? We can time shift almost every single thing, but you don't watch Monday Night Football on Tuesday, and that's really important. The value of that as the ultimate engagement tool, as you push forward over the next, 10 to 15 years is going to drastically increase. Uh, it was already important. And I know we're gonna, you know, there's been a lot of talk today around kind of areas that are recession proof or proof like uh, around that sports, uh, whether you've got an amazing market, a down market, the engagement will always be there. And it's an amazing test bed. The other side of how we look at markets as well is the elite athlete is the, is the ultimate early adopter. If you think about health, wellness, taking guesswork of how we all can feel our best. 
Um, that's not just an elite athlete thing. Everybody wants the right tools to be able to do that. But the elite ath athlete can be the ultimate early adopter around that. And that's there's a lot of different spokes that we'll broadly defined as human performance around that. So those are just kind of some of the areas that we focus on. Uh, my own personal background, I grew up in upstate New York, grew up in poverty, was homeless for parts of my childhood, realized early on sports, academics, my way out. Uh, ended up finding myself at Harvard as an undergrad. I would say the last place in the world I ever thought I would have found myself. Uh, just thought about a complete misfit. Just thought I wouldn't fit in at all. And it really, my time there changed how I looked at the world, taught me to feed this level of curiosity, just woke it up inside me, questioned things that have stood for a long period of time. I knew I wanted to play in the NFL. My backup plan was to be a doctor. Held down four jobs. My dad made $7,000 a year in my senior high school. Held down four jobs, refused to be weeded out uh, during the entire process. I'll fast forward again, ended up being drafted by the Seattle Seahawks uh, in the 2000 draft. Played for eight years, was never a superstar, was not a Sean Merriman over here. Barely survived for, for eight years, week to week. There's not guaranteed contracts in the NFL. And I literally had to fight every single week uh, for eight years on staying, staying involved. I know we'll kind of dive in. Really, my first three years in the NFL, I realized I, I had zero understanding around finance, economics, public markets, private markets. I, had, I just had zero background. I didn't grow up around it. I don't know if you've ever read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It was very much that case. And I took it my first three years in the NFL to learn everything I could from the ground up. And that's what I did. Talked to as many people as I could, read as many books as I could, and started angel investing 19 years ago, embedding into those companies during my entire off season to learn like a fly on the wall. How do you take a concept, commercialize it, et cetera. So that was my kind of early foray into understanding the life of an entrepreneur and how that really paralleled to some of the things that I truly loved about sports, which is this, this idea of a facing immense odds and having to fi find a way every single day, having to motivate, you know, hire a team, motivate, motivate and execute against that strategy, working closely with them. So I'll kind of pause there, but I'll, I'll hand it over to, to Alex on that. Spend a little more time because I know we have time. Hi everyone, um, it's a pleasure for me to be here today uh, with you guys. Uh, so my background, I'm, uh, I, I, I was three-time Olympian, so the 2006, 2010 and 2014 Olympics. Uh, finished first at uh, 2010 and 2014 uh, before retiring uh, after 2014. I didn't want to lose my title. So, <laughs> no, but um, a, a lot of people a, are as a freestyle skier. Freestyle skier. Yeah, exactly. Some of you uh, that uh, knows football, maybe you know Jeremy Bloom, uh, famous uh, American uh, football player and freestyle skier also. So competed with, uh, with Jeremy uh, multiple times. Um, and uh, so, yeah, a lot of people are asking me why uh, you go from freestyle skiing. Uh, often, uh, you're kind of a ski bum to uh, to finance, uh, and then so. But I think I love skiing. I was very passionate about skiing, but I'm even more passionate about competing. Um, and throughout my 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 uh, years as an athlete. Um, on the world stage, I had the opportunity to meet with a lot of executives uh, of businesses, understanding a bit their their role. And I thought there was a tremendous parallels that you can draw in between being an athlete and being an entrepreneur, being a, C a CEO of a business. Uh, and uh, and uh, I was just um, just super curious of, about going there and uh, did my uh, undergrad as a, I wanted to go into my undergrad in finance. And one of my uh, um, one of my mentors told me, Alex, you should actually. Uh, an accountant will learn finance, but a, uh, but a finance guy won't learn accounting. So I, I, I circled back to accounting for a few years, uh, did my years in audit at KPMG and then serv uh, transactional services before aiming uh, my, uh, my new career path uh, towards uh, private equity and finance. Um, now working for Walter Capital in, in a private equity firm uh, based out of Montreal. Uh, it's within a family office, but we uh, receive external capital also. Um, so we are run as a, a financial uh, firm um, and working with lower mid market uh, businesses, entrepreneurs that are so leveraged buyout and uh, grow capital uh, within uh, Canada and do and, and expanding in, uh, into the inter inter international markets also. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of my uh, background in a, in a short. Thanks, thanks. And Ben, love to hear your story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is Ben Gardner. And uh, I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin, just north of Milwaukee. Uh, so I guess that makes me kind of like an honorary Canadian. I know we have a lot of Canadian folks here today. Um, I ended up being uh, recruit number 24 in a class of, of 24. 
uh, to play football at Stanford. So I was actually committed to go play at, at Northern Iowa. And one day I got a, uh, it was about two, two weeks before signing day, before I made it official, I get a call from uh, my guidance counselor at school, who's also one of my football coaches. He says, you know, you need to come into my office and, and sit down. I got a voicemail to play for you. And it was Jim Harbaugh, who was the coach of, of Stanford at the time. Um, and he said, you know, one of our recruits from our class couldn't get into school. Just the admissions uh, council just turned him down. We have one scholarship left. It's yours if you want it, but I have to know tonight. I had never heard of Stanford. I didn't know what it was. I called my mom and said, hey, I got, you know, this scholarship offer from Stanford. She says, you're going to hang up the phone right now with me and call him back and take it. Right. So um, I ended up at Stanford. No uh, real expectation of ever even seeing the field. Didn't really care, honestly. Um, thought it was a great opportunity to get a good education and, and play football. Ended up going a lot better on the football field than I anticipated. Um, was a, a you know three-year starter, an All-American. We won a lot of games. I ended up getting drafted by the Cowboys. When Isaiah says uh, that he was not a superstar in the NFL, he was a superstar compared to me, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> And uh, I bounced around for three and a half years, a lot of injuries, decided uh, I was about to get married, decided to move back to Silicon Valley and put my Stanford degree to work. Um, super fortunate to uh, land a job at Andreessen Horowitz, one of the premier venture capital firms uh, in the Valley. And I worked there for five and a half years and really learned the business. Um, ultimately built out their consumer teams go to market and business development platform. So I got to work with a ton of really exciting and interesting and now famous startups like Pinterest and Buzzfeed and Airbnb and Overtime and Lime and you know the list goes on and on. So really got to understand um, how startups are built um, throughout their life cycle and all the different um, you know pieces that go into it and get an understanding for in the venture capital business, how we can set ourselves up to differentiate from others. It's a very, com very competitive space. Um, so I ran a team of six there. I met Isaiah uh, about a year ago, and uh, we, you know, come from similar backgrounds, shared interests, uh, see the world the same way. We became clear pretty quickly we wanted to find a way to work together. Um, so as of about three months ago, Isaiah and I are partners. I joined Will Ventures um, and really excited about what we're doing in and around sports. I think he did a good job of, uh, you know, explaining kind of our thesis and, and our differentiator. But I won't uh, I won't take up any more time. I'll kick it over to Sean. Well, Sean, you know, before you, you start, I mean, we have the we're sort of the bookends, the University of Maryland bookends in, in, on, on this whole panel here. That's right. Neither one of us would have got into Stanford, probably. But um, you were the quarterback, though, right, Wayne? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sean Merriman, uh, you know, former linebacker for the uh, San Diego Chargers and Buffalo Bills, right, upstate New York, um, and you know, played eight years career, three-time All-Pro, three-time Pro Bowler, defensive rookie of the year. Um, you know, hold several several records still um, for the fastest sacks to uh, I think forty or fifty or something like that uh, in NFL. Um, Went to University of Maryland three years, uh, left as a junior, had an opportunity to, to leave early. They told me I was going somewhere in the, in the first round, top 10 or top 15, and I couldn't leave class soon enough. So, uh, you know, made that jump and um, grew up in Prince George's County, Maryland, which is obviously very close to D.C. Um, and, and like Isaiah here, grew up in, in poverty. Uh, and, you know, those of you know that in the Washington, D.C., the DMV area was hit you know, hard with the, you know, crack epidemic and those things in the late 80s and 90s. It hit uh, Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia area first before it did anywhere else in the country. So that was, you know, pretty much my upbringing, um, you know, single single family. Uh, my mom raised my, me and my two sisters. Um, <clears throat> and uh, coincidentally, I uh, went to Frederick Douglass High School in Upper Marlboro, Maryland, and that's when I earned my nickname, Lights Out. So for anyone out here that, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that was that was that was my sack dance at one point in time. I don't I don't think I can do that now without stretching. But um, I gained my nickname my sophomore year in high school. I knocked out uh, four players in one game, and. Uh, I remember about 20 or 25 students come running up to me and they said, man, you knocked those guys lights out. And I said, yeah, you know what? Called me lights out. 
And that name somehow, some way stuck with me through high school, stuck with me through college, and then obviously on a bigger uh, scale nationwide in the pros. Um, in 2006, because my name was Lights Out for so long, I, I always felt that Lights Out was much bigger than anybody, anything I can do on a football field, and I knew it was a brand. So uh, 2006, I acquired the name and rights and trademarks from a company in Irvine, California. I was 21 years old. I bought it from a company called PJ Salvage, a huge PJ, uh, pajama company in California. Um, I, I began, started to brand Lights Out as a clothing apparel company, um, doing several deals with sports memorabilia shops, and then uh, Tilly's, Packs and Zoomies, and some of the um, you know bigger stores in the country. I think we got up to about 250 doors. Uh, so I always felt the Lights Out was something much bigger than than I ever could be on the field. I just had this uh, this blue mohawk and this cool sack dance to go with it to kind of uh, give it some character, but. Uh, now I own Lights Out Extreme Fighting, which is a uh, feeder league to the UFC and, and some of the other bigger leagues. We are on Fubo TV. I don't know if you guys have Fubo TV in this room or not, but we're currently the, mo uh, the third most watched uh, program behind international soccer. Uh, so just looking to grow the, the name and, and brand, uh, not only nationally, but internationally with, with Lights Out. That was great. That was great. And so Isaiah, let me, let me jump in with you and really getting into the, the overall you know, question, why, why, do, why do you believe, and certainly we do in, at, at 76 Capital and, and, and all of us here really believe there's such a huge opportunity in and around the world of sports today? Yeah, uh, I, I think I already answered a, a couple pieces around that question, but, you know, really as, as you think about, said a different way, even from what I said earlier, you think about the passion around sports, and um, how people associate, uh, you know, define very, very broadly as well, but associate themselves with different aspects around sports in and of themselves. Um, whether you're a pure consumer on sports as an entity for entertainment, et cetera, um, and all of the different adjacencies you can, you can push to beyond that, uh, that is not going away, right? And being able to look at the transformation over the last 20 years in particular around different ways to engage as the ultimate platform and i know you know we could spend a lot of time thinking about this but just look at the differences from linear cable fubo is a great example right from linear cable how it was delivered to your living room 20 years ago to different ways to engage now sports is the ultimate test bed right when you look at ott streaming etc different ways to engage, different ways in which sports is really kind of that test bed to continue to look at different ways to engage uh, and continue to be that tip of the spear as well. There's a lot of different areas. Again, things that I walked through before, the elite athlete is the early adopter, where you can look at how we all want to feel our best, right? Reiterating that, or we all want to recover our fastest. We just want that guesswork taken away, right? Whether that's, and there's, again, different aspects around that from, you know, nutrition to, um, you know, looking at different precise ways of training, under training, over training. But in the end, I'm a retired athlete now. I still want to feel my best, right? And I want to be, have a prescriptive way and, and, and ways to do that. So sports really for us is the central piece for that as the ultimate test bed for that. And Alex, your, what are you about your thoughts in and around sports and investing today? I'm I mean, uh, sport, again, we said it's, it's very emotional. Uh, so it gets to an emotional core. It gets into your, your everyday life, uh, whether uh, at different uh, sphere of, of, of throughout, throughout our lives. Uh, and it, it, it plays a, ma a main role in where, who we are on, the, on our personal side also and what we want to do in our per in, on our personal time. Um, and I think going to that, uh, having a highly emo um, em or emotional core brings a lot of uh, li um, liability uh, of people. So of, of consumers, consumers wants to stick to uh, and, and they're, it's kind of sometimes religious uh, in terms of their, uh, whether it's they like sport or whether it's their living, the way they are living and the way they, they act. So having all of these businesses are actually targeting more and more sustainable revenue uh SaaS businesses having and and i think this fits into the uh in, into multiple investors uh, uh path of 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 lowering the risk on the revenue and having sustainability on their revenue and i think sport brings that type of 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 uh, uh um liability of about uh, customers wanting to remain there 
Um, and uh, I think a lot of network also uh, actually trying to uh, exploit uh, that, that uh, portion of sport that can allow them uh, to have sustainable revenues. Yeah, ben, you said you were at Andreessen Horowitz prior to joining Isaiah at Will Ventures. And you know, what made you leap, make the leap a couple months ago um, to go and really focus on, on the world of sports? Yeah, I mean, I, a couple things. For me, it's really all about the people. Um, and uh, Will Ventures is very unique kind of small family environment of ex-athletes that all think and operate similarly. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just a great environment to work in. But also, I think, uh, you know, I was exposed for many years to the kind of peak of the tier one venture capital ecosystem where these mega firms own, uh, you know, they own the space. But... What I always noticed, and over the years I think proved to be more and more true, was nobody really owned the the sports space from a VC perspective, right? There's a lot of great product folks. There's a lot of great engineers. There's a lot of you know really impressive founders that become VCs and have great reputations, and every entrepreneur wants to take money from them and get them on their board of directors. But there's very few, if any, that really understand the world of sports, have those networks built in, um, know those engagement mechanisms and how to build a company from day one in the space. And so I think there was an opportunity in my eyes for us to be that, right? And to build a moat around the Will Ventures brand and to be the go-to place for anybody that's at the early stages of building a company in and around sports, health and wellness, gaming, sports betting, fantasy sports, uh, you know, consumer media, all of it, right? Um, I think the, the network that we've spent a lot of time collectively building and, and individually building of athletes, of team owners, of media companies that all touch these various pieces of the sports space are just, in, just incredibly valuable for an early stage company and really a growth hack, right? And, and ultimately, when you're thinking about who to raise seed money from, to get your venture off the ground, doesn't make sense to go raise it from a Sequoia or an Excel or even an A16Z. I hope none of my ex-colleagues are in the room, but um, you know you can always go raise from them downstream, right? And so when you're raising that first round of seed funding, the key is who's going to be in the trenches with you and really do what they say they're going to do. And who can deliver a differentiated value add in your specific vertical and space, something that's going to be a hack to get you off the ground and to get you from zero to one. I think we can do that better than anybody else in VC. Well, Sean, I mean, you took a, a little bit different path than, than these guys from an investment perspective, but you took the Lights Out brand bringing, and then created your own league. What has that journey been like so far? And you said you're now the number three show on Fubo TV, which is an incredible you know, feat. What's next for you and where do you see that all going? Well, you know, for us, um, you know, coming from my background and playing in the NFL, I mean, it, football in this country is number one. There's, there's no, no bigger sport in this country than football, but football isn't global. Um, and one thing I realized by getting into the, you know, the fight industry, which is, you know, the fight entertainment industry is that fighting is global. They watch it everywhere in the world. Um, and it's steadily growing. And, you know, we, we thank uh, leagues like UFC for, um, you know, kind of opening that door because even with the UFC, I mean, MMA wasn't even legal in New York until about 2015 or 16. They, so they, they knocked down some doors and broke down some barriers for us. Um, but, you know, being a feeder league and someone is up and coming, it's about really just growing the brand and getting more eyeballs uh, to create that next up and coming star. Right. I mean, uh, you know, you guys, if, if you get a young uh, Conor McGregor, a young uh, champion, you get them, you groom, you know, bring bring them up, you brand them, you promote them um, and, and have those guys uh, as leaders of, of your MMA promotion. It, it's it's huge. But also, too, on our end. And, you know, take it back to a UFC or someone who kind of was growing a brand a long time ago. We have more opportunity now because uh, every day that I wake up, there's a there's a different aspect of tech 
uh, VR. We're going to announce a, a VR here uh, deal here where we're going to be able to watch our next fight on Fubo and, and Facebook and Meta on December 17th. Um, you know, I think UFC is going to do it and then we'll be right after that. So I got to ask you with that. Are you going to actually feel like someone like you punching us? Because I don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I wish. I wish. I wish everybody would, you know, kind of feel what what one of these guys throw a big kick or a hangmaker. But um, you know, that's that's what's next. And and one thing that, that I've learned from playing in the NFL is the reason why the NFL is as big as they are in this country is because of fan engagement. There's an emotional attachment to the game, to your team, to your favorite player, to your organization that they have more than any other sport. Period. And the, the way they've done that through, is through fantasy football. They've done that through having fan engagement interaction through uh, people coming to the games and they're wearing, uh, you know, their favorite team color, or their team organization. Um, and so one thing that I, need, I immediately started to do with Lights Out is having more fan engagement. I mean, pretty soon here, you're going to be able to bet in the sportsbook uh, arena, bet n uh, chokes and knockdowns and, and you can bet rounds in the Fubo app during the fight, which is going to be the first of its kind. Um, and so every single day and every single week that goes by, there's a different vertical that we're adding in there that we haven't touched just yet. And, um, you know, it, it's fun for me because we're, uh, as I started out here a couple of years ago, we initially launched on uh, some of the Fox Sports regionals. Now being able to have, you know, national distribution and international distribution is calling in South America and Asia and uh, Canada here will be showing soon France. Um, and so every day that, that I wake up now becomes fun because there's a different part of this business, whether, whether it's ticket sales, um, sponsorship. Um, right now, content is, is king. It, content for these streaming services and TV platforms, the OTT platforms, uh, but streaming all over the world is, is one of the biggest things in, in live sports. There's no better business to get in right now. And, and as you see, uh, you know, every uh, you know, foreign country or something somewhere is trying to get here in the U.S. to get in live sports. And it's just a very, very fun uh, industry to be in. Well, you mentioned live sports, live sports. You know, they were either depending on what what you what research you look at, 93 or 97 of the top 100 programs over the last year. So it's really amazing an opportunity for the major brands, the global brands. If you want to reach the right people, you want to reach people at all. At that moment, sports is the thing. So, uh, going back to you, Sean. I mean, you, you touched on sports betting. You did as well, Ben. Um, I'd love to get this perspective, which is a little bit different. Is all of you, all of us, right? Grew up as betting and playing sports were. It was like, don't bet, don't bet on it. That was the, the, the basically the the uh, the campaign across colleges, right? Don't bet on it. How do you now see this incredible shift now where we have legalized sports betting in 36 of the 50 states of America and it all happened within the last four years? How is that? What do you, how do you see that shift? And how do you as a, even as like a as a former player where you kind of uh, really had to shift your thinking? Yeah, I think uh, one of the biggest things um, I couldn't tell you what over under was until I retired. Uh, it was one of those things that you could not talk about it. You, uh, you had friends that you knew were betting on the game. They were involved. Uh, but you, it was just a, one of those things that you just didn't want to get close to because it was, a, uh, it was something they didn't want us to do. Uh, but it goes back to having sports and having that attachment, that emotional attachment, and now financial attachment because people are now watching the games, uh, betting on teams, which is going to add viewership, which is going to add, um, you, you know, obviously um, – you know, more on the upside of, 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 and, uh, of what's on the line and watching that game other than your favorite team playing. Now people are betting uh, on the games and more and more states that are opening up to it. You're seeing the revenues just skyrocket. And, and to be honest, we haven't even touched this. We haven't scratched the surface as far as what uh, sports betting is going to be and how interactive it's going to be able to be here in the next, you know, 24 to 36 months for all sports across the board. Yeah, I, you know, I'll just add to that that it's all been sort of legalized recently. But when you think about it holistically, this has been a process. It's been it's been heading this way ever since you know the birth of fantasy football, right? And fantasy baseball, and you know, you go to a New Year's party, and yet your neighborhood, you know, family friends have squares for the Rose Bowl, right? And you pick your squares and whatever it lands on somebody wins a few bucks so we've always been interested in betting on sports in some way shape or form we say hey isaiah you know i think 
I think the Cowboys are going to beat the Seahawks. You want to put 20 bucks on it, right? Like, that's always been sort of ingrained in sports fans' way of life. I think the interesting thing from a business perspective, I've been an avid sports better ever since I retired from the game. Um, and any game that you put a few bucks on, you're ultimately truly invested in from from the first pitch to the last out, right? Um, and it makes it fun. It makes it fun to watch with friends. It makes it fun to have your little group chats on the side and say, hey, what bets do you like for tonight? Um, and it's really a social experience in a lot of ways. And so I think the sort of core sports book betting opportunity is interesting, but that's pretty saturated right now uh, with a lot of incumbents that have deep pockets and they're battling for market share. There's also this entire media ecosystem that is developing around sports betting. Um, and, you know, there's a, you know, a top down ecosystem that ESPN's trying to build out and, and Fox and all of the incumbents there. But there's also like an underground uh, sort of creator economy tie in. A lot of people that are, you know, winning sports bettors living in their mom's basement, spending a lot of time doing research and they are excellent at it. And guys like me will pay to subscribe to them, right? Um, and have them send me their picks. And so I think that's really interesting from a business perspective and from just kind of like an overall social experience and community perspective. Sports betting brings all that to the forefront and creates a really cool, rich experience for sports fans. Yeah, it's great. It's great you mentioned the media side of things. I mean, that's where we at 76 Capital, I mean, we were investors in VEASAN with Brent Musburger and the media, the sports betting network, which we sold to DraftKings last year. I mean, you're starting to see FanDuel TV right now, Barstool, all, you know, even here, you know, here in Miami, right? You have the better, the better network, the better guys doing their thing with Joey and, and Jake Paul and those guys. I mean, so there's some really interesting things that are coming down the pike in the media side of things. Alex, just, oh, God. Oh, okay. I, you know, I just, I, just to add, I couldn't agree more with what you said uh, and what Ben said as well, as well as Sean around, you know, it's been this slow evolution where it went from, that was just a dirty word to say. A player wouldn't even want to be associated around it, et cetera. Not, that you even, could you walk into a casino or a sports no, book? No, no, I was just like, I would, I would, I would stay. Don't let this man so anywhere near a craps table, though. <laughs> <laughs> I love craps. Um, so, you know, I, I think that evolution. I think uh, there's some great case studies as well of like this normalization around dipping the toe in the water with daily fantasy sports is a great point that Ben made, and then that going from just males to you opened up this pie of engagement all the way to you start to look at daily finish sports and season long contests that were involved with everyone in the office everyone in the family the men women all but and you saw this massive user engagements just skyrocket with the nfl in particular i'll, I'll just focus on the nfl this really went across all sports the nfl and they were looking for growth and they saw hyper hyper growth with females being engaged, being involved with Daily Fantasy Sports and saw that kind of sticky. So that kind of like led to this critical mass to then kind of led to um, obviously, you know, pieces around kind of the regulatory approval, et cetera. But those were kind of the early instances as well. And then it was just like, well, everybody's doing this. And this Daily Fantasy Sports is not that much different if you look at prop bets and things that are to come, right? And I know we're gonna probably t dive into more things in the future. It really is the end, it's engagement. And it's broadly defined, it's engagement, and then there's just different shades of engagement around that. Absolutely, and Alex, I mean, you, you're I mean, in Canada, right? So in, in Canada, it was the gray market was kind of okay, and now you have legalization, and go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, to say to you, there's there's different uh, shades of, 50 shades of gray within the, the engagement, and I'm, I'm not somebody, that, I'm not the biggest customer of, of betting, on sport betting, but I follow I follow these, these little types just to, when I go at my friends and I just want to be part of the conversation and a part of the socialization. And once a year, I'm actually watching the Super Bowl at home and betting with my friends, and, but just for socialization. And same thing for Barstool. Uh, I, 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 feel it, I, I, I follow it to be within the game, to follow their humoristic, humoristic side of things also. But uh, yeah, it's, just, it's just about being part of it, um, even though you're not a big uh, better. So. Well, look, I want to change gears because I want to definitely come back to technology. But we have one of the things I wanted to make sure that we we touched on was the tr all of you have been elite in your lives and gotten to the highest of levels, gold medals, 
making it to the NFL, being an all pro. I mean, all these amazing things that you've been able to do, which are just, you know, less than 1% of the rest of us have ever gotten there. But you did with all, you know, how did you do it? And do you believe a lot of the traits and, and things that, you, that made you an elite athlete are making you an elite investor or elite, an elite business person? I'd love to, for you to start, Isaiah, on that. No, I love that question. And absolutely, I think every single person up here would, would say that. And part of that was also this kind of realization as I got you know, ready for retirement, I had you know, nine surgeries at the time, and I kind of saw the writing on the wall, needed two more surgeries to like call it quits. Um, yeah, I wanted to get a ninth year in, couldn't, and started to prepare for that. And I'd paid close attention to men, guys in the locker I'd play with that, A, there was like really two buckets, ones that went on to challenge themselves and ones that didn't. And men, they're at the, like the peak, the height of their powers on like everything. You saw them, the, the, the guys that didn't go and challenge themselves, they became almost a shell of themselves. I, you see them two, three, four years later, they stopped pushing. They stopped pushing in, in boundaries. And I remember I had an amazing mentor early on as I was transitioning out and talking to people around that. And he really, he's like, Isaiah, you need to be passionate about something. You were passionate about football. You need to find that again. And you need not only is football going to be difficult to recreate in just one thing? You need to look at aspects of your life and all of the things that you really enjoyed about the game, and you need to drive that. You need to feed that, find that in a healthy way uh, somewhere else. And it was almost like this taking inventory around what, 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 you know, what I was driven by and finding out what else I could be passionate about. And that took talking to more and more and more people who loved their job, who didn't love their job. You know, what, what things did I really like to do, be able to do, to do that as well? And those aspects that actually I just I had mentioned earlier, um, A, being an entrepreneur is amazing. So, you know, after retiring, decided, all right, I need a formal base of knowledge. Went to Harvard Business School to get my MBA to get that formal base of knowledge. I loved working with entrepreneurs. I knew I liked the investment side of it, but I got great piece of advice also around that recreation of all those different things. Of If you want to eventually invest into entrepreneurs, put yourself in those shoes. It's unbelievably important to have this authentic understanding of how difficult it is to be an entrepreneur. You know, lay it all on the line and go do how that. How similar is that to being a football player? Very similar. That, that, that was going to be my like, final point, which is there is the, you know, the no, it's, it's, it's exactly that, that parallel of laying all on the line. And again, those, those ideas around building a team, executing against strategy, motivating, right? Do people believe in not just you building a widget or creating some type of product, they actually believe in the company and the leadership of the company around that. There's ways to do that as an entrepreneur. There's ways to do it as an investor, as you know, as well. All those things I love. One quick anecdote. As I was transitioning out of the NFL and get, was in my first board meeting, going from unbelievably cutthroat NFL, where everyone's yelled at you, it's, it's, you're so used to uh, being undressed. My coach is like, you know, yelled at, at, at like nonstop at your work. Metaphorically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember going into my first board meeting and sitting. I'm like, wow, someone's really going to get yelled at here. This is going to be like just, and I was like, wow, people were talking civilly and disagreeing and res being respectful. I was like, all right, this is how it's done. It's not that hard. Okay, like we can do this. Uh, I think that was like a, a kind of big, a big wake up moment for that as well. But also seeing that, you know, this idea of giving credit where credit is due, which is core to sports and kind of how we've always done things, that doesn't always exist in every single culture, or every corporate culture, every entrepreneur culture, looking for entrepreneurs that do that recognize those um, that are doing amazing work as well. Super important. Yeah, Sean, I see you shaking your head over there. on, on the <laughs> No, no, he, I mean, he's right, because I, I think that um, I think one of the big, one of the biggest things of being a, an athlete really is is the ability to push through. And we are some of the most disciplined people on planet Earth. Well, like we, we are. I mean, we're forced to be somewhere at, 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 every, at some point in time during the day before a meeting start, a practice start, a weight room, uh, uh, you know, weight room time start, or we get fined 5000 So that kind of made us a little bit more disciplined than uh, anyone else. But um, that's what you need um, in, in kind of when you're transitioning out, right? You got to be more disciplined with your time and where you spend your time and where you're spending money, where you're, you know, allocating certain things. And um, what I see a lot of times, especially when people starting out and, and they're trying to figure it out as they're making that transition is uh, finding their passion and what they want to do. 
it is very hard to replace, you know, running out to the stadium of 70,000 people screaming your name and, and millions of people watching on TV. There's nothing like that you're ever going to do when you're done. So what else can you find that is going to give you that same passion that you did after making a big play, a block or interception or whatever that touchdown? And once you find that passion, we're unstoppable in trying to build our next team because we, like I said before, we have the discipline. Uh, we're going to be very disciplined what we're doing. And now we have that passion that drove us to do what we did or in our respective sport. And so with those two things combined, uh, that's why you see a lot of former athletes who really figure it out early. They succeed because we bring something to the table that most people struggle with. And that's being disciplined and, and finding that same passion to motiv motivate yourself and be relentless and get to that next level. And, um, you know, I always say that's, that's what I, you know, kind of credit my, the, the, the success I had early on is have, finding my passion and what I wanted to do. It was no doubt in my mind. I mean, I could have went back and played another year or two. Um, I, yeah, I got cut once. I didn't like that. And so uh, I experienced that feeling and I, and I realized that I wanted to transition into building a brand lights out. But it was de definitely discipline and finding that passion into the next phase. Go ahead, man. Yeah, I, I completely agree with with all of that. I think uh, being a professional athlete is, is super unique in a lot of ways, but one of the ways that it's probably the most unique is that the thing that you spend your entire life pushing towards and dedicating your life to and your identity is entirely wrapped up in it, that career is done at 30 years old, right? So you're left there at some point, you know, looking around and saying, okay, what now? Like, I've never even thought of it. It's too hard to be thinking about what's next a lot of the time. The, you know, some folks do it and they do it well and they really spend their free time wisely. I wasn't talented enough to do that. Like, I had to pour every ounce of my, you know, work ethic and talent into the game of football to just make it to the NFL, right? Um, and so it's you know, incredibly difficult coming out and transitioning out and trying to figure out, okay, what do I do with the next 40 years of my life? Um, I, I think it all boils down to ultimately what drives elite athletes is that competitive nature and being a part of a team, being a part of something bigger than themselves. Um, and so you have to f find something where you can channel that competitive fire and really feel like when I wake up in the morning, I'm driving towards something like today matters. Everything I do today matters because when you're playing a sport, everything you do matters. And when you're, when that sport is taken away from you, you wake up and you know, for me, I know it was, it was a good solid year where I was thinking like, I could just lay in bed all day for, you know, the next two weeks and it doesn't matter. Nobody's relying on me. Right. And so that accountability to yourself, that accountability to others, that, uh, you know, that venue to channel all of that competitive fire that is built over years and decades of, of the sport and the pursuit of greatness. Um, it's really difficult, but when you find something that, that can fulfill some of those things, um, you know, athletes are incredible employees. They're incredible entrepreneurs. They're disciplined, as Sean said, um, and, you know, uh, you know, relentless. And I think that's a, that's a really important word too. Yeah, so Alex, yeah. what I was saying is that, you know, you think about all these traits, you know, the passion, the desire, the drive, the resiliency, having to get up after falling down on the slopes, right? Like, how do you take those traits and then transfer them and help the entrepreneurs, the, the business owners that you invest in to have those same, that same kind of mindset? I think two things again that you mentioned, uh, like that really resonate and that I buy into is is team and passion. Um, I always see myself, even though I evolved into an individual sport, people say oh, it's totally different than being on a team sport. It is not, because uh, uh, the only 23 seconds in a four-year cycle I was the only one working was at the Olympics. For the for the rest of the time, we were a big team. Uh, of professional um, and what an entrepreneur does when you think what an entrepreneur does in life is it put it it puts himself his product or his service in a position to succeed in the marketplace that's what an athlete does he surround himself with the right tools with the right people to be able to succeed in the marketplace there's tons of things in sport we do not control and we can't focus on it um, tons, of thing, tons of things in the marketplace that you do not, do not control as in a, there's tremendous parallels. So that's teamwork. That's learning to how to build, uh, build yourself with the right tools around you. Looking at what 
a good thing that acne do and uh, and they're very good at is looking at themselves in the mirror without lying to themselves because they have so many pe competitive people doing so and to make it to the next level. I think it's super important and that's something that I've learned through sport. And again, the last thing was passion. I think it, 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 it appears in everybody. It appears, I think, all the athletes that kept passion, that planned the next passion, um, or the athletes that are, are, are looking to, what, uh, what's my next day? Like again, you said uh, waking up in the morning and, and, and having a purpose. You, you don't eat an elephant in one bite, but I, when, you're in, when you're an athlete and you look at your next career and if you didn't plan, yes, it looks like a huge elephant. One step at a time, make, make, make yourself going to our, towards that passion. I think it's, it's super important. And a lot of people uh, are asking me, like, oh, you, you, you're uh, in private equity, you're always looking into having good assets. Yes, and on lower mid market, we're looking into having passionate entrepreneurs, passion. We're in the be people's business. We're in the recruitment. Yes, if they have a good, yes, if they have a good asset, but having a, 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 the alignment of interest of everybody around the table is super, super, super important and key. If they don't, if they have a good asset, but they don't have uh, the passion for it, we're, I, I, we're not going to discuss very long. Well, let's, let's shift a little bit into technology and, and investing in technology and the use of technology. And Sean, you know, right now, a couple of years ago, we used to have these kind of conversations on panels and I would say, you know, you got to keep your eye out what's going on from in the sports world because Apple and Google and, and Amazon, they're, they're, they're coming to the world of sports. They're going to come and now they're here. You want to watch Thursday Night Football? You got to use Amazon Prime, right? If you want to go and watch the MLS next year, you got to have it on Apple TV. They're here in a big, big way. So technology is becoming a really big part of the world of sports with data and analytics and, and all the things that, are, that, that, that it's being used for, whether it's augmented reality or virtual reality, all the things you're saying, how are you using it with Lights Out today? You know, um, one of the first things, uh, you know, we had the regional uh, deal with the partnership with Fox Sports, um, which but they, were great to, they were great to work with, but <clears throat> when I wanted to start venturing, venturing down the, the alley of, of adding more tech into the MMA, you know, I, I, the first thing I thought of is, is, first of all, number one is fan engagement because I learned that playing in the NFL, there was no, no one better than them when it comes to fan engagement, getting more fans involved and, and in tune with what they were doing. But two is how do we bring an experience to everybody that's at home that won't be able to make our fights? I mean, our fights, we typically sell out anywhere between 1,500 and 2,000 people. Uh, and we would like to, you know, for the most part, stay there for a while. But how can we get our fights in the hands of everyone at home and make them feel like they're there. That was the number one goal, um, you know, when, when I started to launch Lights Out with Fubo. And Fubo has been a great partner because they have, you know, acquired a lot of tech, whether it's ad tech, uh, whether it's, uh, they just acquired it, the, I believe the number one uh, streaming service in France. And so now we will, a lot of our fights be shown in France. And they're constantly being able to add tech where you can buy products during our fight through the app. You know, there's things that pop up and you can click on it. So we want our we want the fans and the people watching at home to feel at the fight. I mean, if you can't make it to the fight, we want you to feel the closest thing there. And I feel like every single week somebody is introducing something that it's either some kind of data sharing platform or get the fights in front of new eyeballs. Like I said, the VR, which we're going to announce here probably won't. Well, I guess technically I made the announcement here. I just right? did. I just did. We so. broke some news. <laughs> yeah. So. Right here in Miami. Yeah. So World uh, Strategic Forum. That's right. That's right. So um, you know, that's that's the first part. But the second part is, you know, how can we get it in the hands of more people at home? You know, I would I would love to when you open up your, your iPhone or your Samsung, whatever device you have, you better click on the app and watch this immediately. And I mean those those type of things I've been working on for months and and that's how tech uh I, I believe in the long run is going to expand the, the world of sports. Absolutely. Ben, you know, from your perspective, investing in what's next in sports. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think it's a, you know, it's long been in the venture capital business kind of a, a stay away market. I think uh, a lot of VCs say, you know, it's just really hard to build a venture scale business um, in the sports industry. And I think largely that's been true. But I think there's some key platform shifts that are kind of taking place before our eyes that are changing the landscape a little bit. Because um, when you think about how the sports business is structured, right, the NFL and the NBA and all of these leagues are fat and happy off of these long-term linear broadcast deals. 
and they have their ticketing partners and they just outsource everything, right? And they get paid up front and their executive bonuses are really good and they don't have to worry about much other than the product on the field or the court or wherever it is. Um, but there's a, you know, a, a new generation of kind of younger, hungry, innovative executives coming up through the ranks at these organizations that have seen the Netflixes of the world and have seen business model innovation in the form of, you know, subscriptions and, and the likes um, where, you know, you start to think about this product and the engagement that we've talked about that, that sports inherently have baked into them and say, we are leaving so much money on the table by outsourcing all of this, right? And, and when you look at streaming tech and the ability to cherry pick different uh, vendors and different features to layer on top for interactivity, you can bring all of that in house. You can own the customer relationship uh, rather than outsource it and, you know, uh, you know, throw your hands up and say, well, I don't know who was watching uh, our game and I don't know who was in the seats at our game because they got their tickets through the secondary market off of Ticketmaster or StubHub or SeatGeek and it had been sold three times already. It's like, if you're a sports organization or a stadium o owner or a league executive, the more of that experience you can bring in house, the more control you can have, the more you can um, kind of serve that customer throughout its life cycle. You can boost the lifetime value. You can, you know, sell and upsell and cross sell and all of those things that are important in you know building a business and maximizing revenues. And I think you know the sort of evolution of all of these data products and streaming products. And things like blockchain are very promising, um, potentially in you know ticketing and provenance and all of that. Um, and I just think it's a really interesting time for leagues and teams and media companies to reimagine what the whole sports experience looks like from a fan perspective and from a you know a, a producing perspective. That's really well said. And we only have about a minute left here at our our sports panel here at the World Strategic you know Forum here. So. Let's, let's do some quick, real quick questions, starting with you, Isaiah. Who do you think is the most, going to be the most influential person in sports over the next year? Uh, I don't know about all of sports, but if, like, I'll stay on the theme around sports betting and some thought leadership. I think Jay Snowden from Penn National Gaming, uh, which just- Penn acquired, Entertainment now. Yeah, right? which, yeah, exactly, Penn Entertainment, sorry. Yeah. Um, they had acquired Barstool Sports, and they understand where- they cost their, the customers going and what their funnel looks like that they have physical real estate space as well as that digital platform as well i think jason Rob i'll give shout out to jason robbins DraftKings as well i think two people i'll be you got big players All right, real quick alex wood on the line uh well that's a very good question i <laughs> i'm not very much in uh i don't know it's um I i'll think about it ben <laughs> next one i was a bit the most influential person in sports for the next year gosh uh, I'm going to have to say Jerry Jones because the Cowboys are going to win the Super Bowl. Oh, man. <laughs> Killing me as an Eagles fan. All right. Just, just like a Cowboys fan. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say, uh, you know, Michael Rubin and, and Fanatics. I, I believe that, you know, now that outside of the apparel and everything they've, they've already done, I think that them getting to this to this field of, of sports betting and what they're building over there, I think that uh, Mike Rubin, Michael Rubin and, and Fanatics and what, they, what they're doing are, are going to take things to a new heights. Let's go on. So you got it? Yeah, I think Giselle, because all the, all the sports actors all right, will look yeah. around there. All right, but we have one last question, then we'll wrap up. Here's, what we're gonna say. What will, here's, here's the thing. What will shock the world when this happens in the world of sports? What's that thing that's going to shock the world? Start with you. Right, get, get, get Sean. I, I think it's going to be tech. I mean, it's some kind of VR or uh, argumented thing, something happened. If you see that right now with sports, uh, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, somebody's going to get in and just do something that has never been done before. Uh, you know, some kind of, um, what, what do you call those, uh, the, the big illusion? What do you, um, you know, it's, it's going to be something that happened. A hologram. It's going to be some kind of hologram, something that some bad player is going to do. Uh, I mean... I'm going to speak this into existence. Maybe I'll hit like a 10 leg parlay for, you know, a million bucks or something. On, uh, love it. Bowl. Love it. A, a bit in the same uh, era, but on, I think on a, on a fan basis, I think the people will remain on the field, but because they, they need that reality happening. But as a fan, you might actually watch and, and drag yourself VR wise. I like it. I like it. Isaiah. A uh, long time coming. It's been a long build, but when we get to zero latency on data, and feeds from live sporting events to people that are not there. So you look at hyper engagement, especially when you think about prop betting, et cetera, 
that will be a game changer. I'll, I'll also say, uh, I think women's sports has a lot of upside, and we've invested quite heavily in, in that. It's I like that. Well. Isaiah, Alex, Ben, Sean, thanks so much. I'm Wayne Kimmel. Really appreciate it. Thanks, World Sports Strategic Forum.